Well, welcome everybody. This is Nicolette Noon. It's great to have you back or have you joining us for the first time. Uh, I've, been I've been advised that it's Thursday, so I'm in the right place. I hope you're all in the right place. And I'd like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy comprising the Siksika, Bikani and Kainai First Nations, as well as the Sutsina First Nation, the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations, the city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3, and it's with great gratitude that we welcome you here today and share this space. Today, we are very welcome, very, very pleased to welcome Alana Bartel to Nickel at Noon. Her talk is called To Dig Holes and Pierce Mountains, and I have wanted to bring Alana Bartel to Nickel at Noon for a long time. Alana comes from a long line of water witches. Her site responsive works explore divination as a way of understanding across places, species, and bodies. Through collaborative and individual works, Alana creates relationships between the personal sphere and the landscape, particular to this time of ecological crisis. She's a member of a group called Fathom Sounds, a collective of artists that have come together to think long-term about the health of water and the role artists play in responding to ur urgent ecological, political, and social issues that collect around water. Her work has been presented in exhibitions and festivals uh, nationally and internationally. Um, including uh, sort of closest to home, the Walter Phillips Gallery in Banff, Plugin ICA in Winnipeg, and the Access Gallery in Vancouver. In 2019 and 2021, she was longlisted for Canada's Sobe Award. Uh, she's been artist in residence with the Eastern Edge Gallery, the Santa Fe Institute, the Banff Center for the Arts and Creativity, and the Canadian Forces Artist Program Station in Latvia. Her artwork is in the collection of the Art Gallery of Alberta, the City of Calgary, Alberta Foundation for the Arts, the RBC Art Collection, and in various private collections. She is of Scottish, German, English, French, Irish, and Danish ancestry, and she's a white settler Canadian currently living in Mokinsis, Calgary, Alberta, where she is also a sessional instructor with the Alberta University for the Arts. Alana, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here today. And I will stop sharing and give it over to you. Oh, great. All right, thank you so much. Um, I'm really excited to be here today and share this work with you. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a project that began um, in the spring of 2020 called Processes of Remediation, Art Relationships, Nature. So this was a multi-part project uh, that I began with the University of Lethbridge Art Gallery. And the project involved uh, uh, online and some in-person residency. It was kind of at the beginning of COVID. So we were um, kind of figuring out how to approach this project overall with um, the restrictions in place. Um, I also mentored two emerging artists and the project is uh, culminated now with an exhibition uh, that was at the University of Lethbridge Art Gallery and currently it's at the Dunlop Art Gallery in Regina uh, at their Sherwood branch. So I really want to thank uh, Josie Mills, the curator that uh, supported the project, uh, also um, helped with getting grant funding. Um, this overall project really led to a lot of new work, but also new relationships and new ideas and gave me a lot of time, um, you know, that is so needed for artists to really develop new work and, and research. So to make this series of work, I visited abandoned coal mine sites in the Crow's Nest Pass in southwestern Alberta. So for those that don't know, it's a low mountain pass in the Rocky Mountains that bridges the two provinces colonially named and defined as Alberta and British Columbia. So here you see me working in one of these abandoned coal mine sites to develop a new series of drawings that I'll, I'll talk about later. First, I wanted to uh, just share two of the emerging artists I worked with. Uh, this is Kylie Feinde. 
And the project she developed uh, is called Earth Blanket and you can watch it now at uh, uleg.ca. So I encourage everyone to check it out. It's a really beautiful uh, piece where she used um, clay that uh, she gathered from the banks of the Old Man River. And she created this large scale um, uh, loom to create a beaded blanket and then um, does this uh, performance in the landscape. And then also that includes like returning the object itself to the landscape. So, um, so definitely uh, check that out. And you can also see a bit of her process on there um, and as well as some writing that she did about the project. And then the other artist is Angeline Simon, and uh, she's developing a solo exhibition for the University of uh, Lethbridge Art Gallery uh, for 2022. And her work uh, draws and reflects on her Malaysian, Chinese, and German ancestry and heritage. And she uses a lot of photographic collage techniques in her work. Um, so the exhibition she's working on is gonna be looking at the history of the Chinatown in Lethbridge. So, Look out for that in early 2022. So a lot of my conversations with Kylie and Angeline and kind of working with them and the other people I connected with throughout this project were really taking up that concept of remediation and what do we mean by that. And so a lot of my previous work was looking at uh, orphan well sites in Alberta and um, other environmental issues. And so with that project, I really wanted to interrogate this term and say, well, what, what do we really mean when we're talking about remediating a site? So usually uh, within the context of the industry, we'd be talking about removing contamination or pollution from soil or potentially water or air. But what does it mean to kind of look at this issue or this, this concept in more nuanced and deeper ways and more holistic ways that talk about um, you know, it's not just about that side, it's about a, a way of thinking about our relationship to the earth. So um, also my work, uh, when, I, when I do research, a lot of it um, is site specific. And I also try and find ways to open up my research process to the public and really engage them in the process. So uh, this is a image of one of the events um, that I did at the Cute Center for Western Heritage in Manton. This is Kara Matthew. She's the head horticulturalist at the Cute Center. Um, and she, I met with her. She, um, uh, I'm really interested in learning about plants and particularly like indigenous plants to Alberta and also plants that have been naturalized and um, invasive species as well. So she provided me with a lot of extensive plant knowledge about local plants and health. And the Coot Center is a botanical garden, but it's also a working farm that um, the University of Lethbridge owns. So, um, so I was able to go and spend time there and, um, and Kara led several walks. And this was kind of a way of like sharing that um, learning with others. Also as part of my research, um, I met with Mitsutipi uh, Blackfoot elders and knowledge keepers. So I really want to thank Mary Fox, Bruce Wolfchild, Monty Littleplume, Andrea Fox, and Melissa Shouting for sharing their knowledge about Blackfoot protocols with the land and plants, which really had a, a big impact um, on my thinking as well. So a lot of the work with this um, project related to Grassy Mountain, which many people might be aware of if they've been following um, the public outcry and the uh, debate around uh, open pit coal mining in southwestern Alberta that has really evolved over the last year. So there was a proposed open pit coal mine um, to be located on Grassy Mountain and, and that's what you see here. This is a still from one of the video pieces in the exhibition. Um, Grassy Mountain initially was really interesting to me. I wasn't aware of the proposed mine and the more I learned about it, the more I felt it, it seemed really relevant. And this is before uh, people were really even becoming aware of this issue. Um, so it was really interesting to see that throughout this exhibition and, and it's continuing now, um, just the awareness and uh, the pushback and the um, grassroots organizing uh, on the part of groups like Mitsitipi Water Protectors, also CEPAWS, Alberta Wilderness Association, the Livingston Landowners Group. There's been um, a lot of organizing, discussion, um, petitions. So ultimately the mine that was proposed here was rejected 
Um, and uh, so that was like pretty unexpected actually, because the company Riversdale Resources, which is an Australian mining company through its subsidiary uh, Benga Mining had been um, undergoing since 2014, uh, the process of, of getting approval to have an open pit coal mine on the site. But as you can see, this mountain has been previously mined. So in my research, one of the sites I kept going to was the Green Hill Mine Complex. And so that company that owned that um, mining operation was the same company that was strip mining um, Grassy Mountain in the 1950s. So you can see that, you can, you can still see the scars of the strip mining on the mountain. Um, so. So I was really thinking about this legacy of what's been left in the past and how are we learning from that legacy of you know, underground coal mining and, and how does that impact our future actions and our relationship with this landscape. Um, I was also doing a lot of research on the species that would be impacted by open pit coal mining, should these coal mines be approved? And I should say that you know, this is just one of many mines and, and um, not all of these mines have been rejected. There's a lot of exploration that's happening in the area. Um, and I'll show in a later slide some more information about that if you're interested in learning more. Another thing is that um, the type of coal that is being mined in these open pit coal mines or is being proposed to be mined is metallurgical coal. So it's not coal that's used to burn for electricity, it's coal that's used to make steel. So that was also something that I found really fascinating was just all the different uh, ways that extraction show, continues to show up even as we're trying to transition away from say burning coal for electricity, which Alberta has planned to do um, by 2030. So, um, so this coal would be uh, shipped overseas where it's in high demand to make steel. So this is an image of one of the open pit coal mines. So this is potentially you know, what could happen to these mountains um, if these open pit coal mines um, move forward and are approved. So it's pretty devastating, I think, to look at, you know, just the impacts of this coal mining on the landscape. And often, you know, in, in doing the research, and, and this is all publicly accessible online too, if you want to go look at the um, information that the uh, joint review panel has reviewed, um, you know, proposals from mining companies um, and to see the impacts and so remediation and reclamation, these are terms that get used to kind of justify this type of destruction and, and extraction, right? Because the idea is that well, through remediation processes, we can restore the landscape to somewhat of, you know, as close to what it was um, before the damage occurred in the first place. Yet, you know, just looking at this landscape and, and from every scientist I spoke to and, and as well as like other people, like these landscapes are never the same, right? Because it takes, you know, um, hundreds and hundreds of years for soil to um, build up and for, you know, all of the complex relationships that are established on these mountain ranges, uh, which are really um, ecologically important and, and special, not only for uh, humans, but for the plants and the wildlife. So the, they're just destroyed through these processes. At the same time, um, I was also thinking about, you know, um, how a lot of this is invisible. You know, this kind of extraction is happening at these massive scales, but we don't often, we're not necessarily confronted with it. Although this, this photograph was given to me by a friend who went on a tour of one of these sites. This is in Elk Valley. Uh, in British Columbia. And so, you know, when we are shown these types of landscapes, it's done in this very specific way and you're given specific, you know, viewpoints. And so it's kind of done in this way that is almost meant to impress us with the scale and um, the, the result of this extraction. Um, so a question I kept thinking a lot about in developing this work is like, how do we build relationships with damaged landscapes? How are we aware of the impacts? How do we process the emotional impacts of um, you know, the devastation that happens in these, in these sites? And a big concern um, that I was thinking about and as I learned more and more about the impacts of open pit coal mining uh, was water contamination and also just 
um, the amount of water that's required for these types of operations. So um, in somewhere like Alberta, where you know water is a very precious resource, you could say that everywhere, but particularly here in the prairie provinces, um, water is a huge concern. So this is just an image to kind of give an overview of the watershed. And um, many of uh, Alberta's headwaters come from these locations in the Rocky Mountains. So it's incredibly important to protect to protect where the headwaters come from because if they get contaminated, you know, potentially all of the watershed can become contaminated. So selenium is a naturally occurring um, element in the environment, but with open pit coal mines, um, too much of it is released and it goes into the water stream and you only have to look at um, the contamination crisis that has evolved from the open pit coal mines um, in uh, BC and Elk Valley, which has gone all the way into the US. And so now it's, it's really considered an international water contamination crisis. And the way that um, some of that contamination shows up is in the fish. So there's a lot of uh, deformities, there's population, decrease. Um, it, it's also very damaging to humans. So, um, so this is a real concern. Um, another thing that happened while I was developing this project is that the Alberta government um, uh, removed uh, the um, 1976 coal policy that was protecting um, uh, the Rocky Mountains. So it restricted open pit coal mining in ecologically sensitive areas. And I won't go into the details, but there were different categories. Grassy Mountain happened to fall on category four, which didn't have very good protections. And I don't know if it's because it had been previously mined, but that might've been a reason. Um, anyway, so this, this whole policy was removed um, in June of 2020 without any public consultation, without any consultation to First Nations. Um, it was just gone. So as the public became aware of this, um, you know, a lot of uh, awareness was building, there was a lot of outcry. So the policy is now back in place, but it's temporary. So there is now a consultation process that um, I believe the results should be uh, coming out soon, actually. And, um, and so, but even that consultation process was kind of fraught with a lot of issues and the way it was being approached. So I think this is really, these are issues that the public and, and everyone should really continue to follow um, and continue to um, keep, keep up on because, um, because it's incredibly important and it's still ongoing and evolving. So uh, Another part of my research was going to the Crow's Nest Pass and spending time there. It was an area I haven't really been able to visit. I've been living in Alberta for the past six years now, so I'm still really, um, you know, feeling really new to the province in a lot of ways. And a lot of my work has um, delved into issues of resource extraction in the province. So I felt going to these places and really seeing how um, how I felt in them and how I responded to them, how other people I met with um, are, are confronting these types of issues was really important. So this is one of the creeks that uh, actually goes around Grassy Mountain. It's called Gold Creek. And it is critical habitat for um, this species of fish, which is the West Slope cutthroat trout. Um, and so it's been declared critical habitat for this species, um, and it falls within the footprint of the uh, proposed Grassy Mountain Coal Project. Yet, you know, this project could still move forward. So again, I kept going back to thinking about the ways that these policies, colonial policies, are developed to, you know, try and protect and um, support wildlife um, and species at risk, but yet, you know, this, this project could potentially still move forward. Um, and it's great that it didn't. But um, so these fish were um, a species that I kept kind of coming back to and thinking a lot about. There's been, um, as I said earlier, quite a few deformities found in them, um, uh, especially in, in BC due to the selenium poisoning. And this is one of the sites that I visited. Uh, it is a, uh, you might be able to hear the water there. So this was part of the Green Hill Mining Complex. And this stream is coming out of the mouth of one of the abandoned underground coal mines. So 
you know, when these operations ceased to exist, like there weren't any kind of remediation practices in place. So there was no policy or um, regulatory body saying, well, you have to clean up these sites. So um, <laughs> just looking at this water, there are all of these really eerie kind of ghostly strands of, I'm not exactly sure what they are, but it smelled really bad of sulfur. So I'm sure that there's still, you know, potentially minerals coming out of these old mine sites. And if we're not doing the testing to, to monitor the environment, which is another thing that was impacted during COVID, the government stopped a lot of environmental monitoring that was happening. Um, you know, how are we going to know? Um, so I think in some ways we, we know just instinctively by being in some of these places and that you can see visibly and smell and sense that, okay, something is wrong in these sites. So, um, so I kept thinking about sort of how we experience, these, experience ex contamination and experience these damaged places kind of through our entire bodies, um, you know, not just uh, through, through our visual sense. So really the reality too is that, you know, these landscapes are never the same after um, these kinds of operations occur. This is, um, this is another view of that section of the Green Hill Mining Complex. And a lot of my work has dealt with sites of abandonment and really looking at histories of resource ex extraction, not only in the past, but in the present. And, um, and you know, looking at, uh, you know, ways that we can um, acknowledge these sites and, and not just uh, kind of dismiss them. This was uh, Leo, which uh, was a very short-lived uh, mining town, um, not uh, far from Blairmore, and um, these were coal coking ovens, and they're still standing. They're quite, quite impressive. All of these bricks were actually numbered and they were sent over um, from Europe. Uh, I can't remember which country now, but um, mm. uh, anyways, and it was uh, rebuilt here. And so there are remnants of buildings, foundations that are kind of crumbling um, at some of these sites, which are now also, you know, called ghost towns, and they feel very haunted. Um, and so you have a lot of these like boom and bust towns throughout the province, but um, especially like in this area of the Crow's Nest Pass. So as I was spending time there and, and um, hiking and Kind of learning about these histories and the environment. Um, I was also looking at like how are people connecting with the landscape today. So you know people are doing similar things like hiking, um, camping. So I kept coming across a lot of different campfire sites and I was really drawn to the just natural charcoal that was left over in these campfire sites and wanting to work with it as a material. To me, it really evoked um, coal, and uh, and so I started collecting it, um, and then I began this series of uh, drawings. So this is uh, this one is in the Green Hill Mining Complex. I was really drawn to the coal shoots. So here you see me. Um, basically taking a charcoal rubbing of the coal chute and I was thinking about the flow of these you know coal chunks that would have um, moved through these operations and wanting to um, kind of connect it to the flow of, of water in some way so I was really drawn into the textures that were made so these metal chutes they would get all dented uh, from all of the coal um, you know, just dropping onto them and they were really incredible. So um, I would take these long sheets of vellum and cover the entire shoot and then uh, spend time just uh, rubbing the charcoal over the surface. And even if I did the same shoot more than once, uh, it would always look different, just kind of depending on, um, you know, really subtle things like, uh, maybe the piece of charcoal or how hard I was pressing um, or how slow or fast I was um, working on the piece itself. So I was thinking a lot about um, texture and touch and, and really wanting to um, make these places tactile in some way for the viewer. 
So the resulting series is actually called um, Today Coals and Pierce Mountains, Coal Shoot Rubbings, the title of this talk. And that, that phrase comes from another part of my research, which I'll talk about um, in a few minutes. And so this is just uh, kind of, you know, gives you a sense of some of the, the details of those pieces. There's also, again, going back to this idea of like bridging distances and, and how do we connect people with these sites when, especially in urban um, spaces where we might not be going to these places or even when we go there, we might not, um, we might just hike a hiking trail where we don't even encounter any of this um, evidence of uh, resource extraction. And really Canada or so-called Canada is built upon resource extraction. So how, how are we kind of, um, thinking about this history uh, when we are you know, um, enjoying these spaces or, or out on the land. Um, and so even accessing the grassy mountain site is not really possible. And actually I was just recently driving um, back through that region and they since um, blocked the road. So the company is appealing the decision to reject the mine. Um, and uh, and so clearly, like there's there's still um, somewhat in control of that site, so it's it's not readily accessible. So I I did um, walk up that road, and uh, there was this sign that was kicked over, which said "Work Area Keep Out," and so I took a rubbing of, of the sign. And so in doing these actions, like at the site in these places, um, I'm also like thinking about like how I am a white settler in your own, um, indigenous land and, and thinking about like, what does that mean to be making this work at this time and thinking about uh, how, you know, First Nations rights and treaty rights are being violated by these types of, of operations too, because they can't access um, these areas. So the, this is uh, one of two resulting works uh, from the Grassy Mountain Road rubbings. Another uh, really fascinating part of my research was learning about the canaries that were brought into the coal mines um, in the past, into the underground mines. And the canaries were used as a warning system. And you always hear that phrase, you know, canary in the coal mine, and it gets applied more and more to these days to many things, especially in regards to climate change, right? And, and we're just seeing more and more warning signs, right? Of, of, um, what is to come. But uh, so going back to like the origins of this metaphor, miners, coal miners would bring canaries into the coal mines. Um, and they were, like I said, this kind of warning system. So if there was, you know, ca carbon monoxide or um, uh, different types of dangerous gases, the canaries would start to kind of alert the miners. Um, and I thought originally that maybe they would sing, but um, I learned that usually the canaries that were brought into the mines were female and the female canaries don't sing like the males do. They're also maybe considered less attractive because they're not as brightly colored. So, um, so they were, you know, I guess, considered good for this type of, of labor, <laughs> like another layer of, of um, exploitation and, and kind of extraction of the canary's labor in this situation. So this is a canary cage and you can see there's like a little water container and there's food. And, um, and if you just do a Google search, you can see images of miners like putting their little canary cage next to their workstation in a mine. And, um, and also, you know, it's kind of fascinating because there were these really like obviously tender relationships that were developed between the miners and canaries. You could see like images of miners holding their canary or when they would pass away, sometimes they would like make a little, even found an example of a little coffin that was made for a canary um, with its name on it. So, um, so this is a, a kind of tradition that comes from Britain as well, uh, where they were using canaries um, and other European countries. Um, and so a lot of the time the canaries would just kind of be flapping around and then they would pass out. So that was sort of the warning sign. Um, but canaries were also really hard to get your hands on. So they didn't want their canaries just dying. Um, so this machine was made, which um, I 
call it a canary resuscitation device. And I saw a picture of it. This is taken at the um, Bellevue Mining Museum. And I was like, wow, this is wild. So basically it was like a little um, uh, device where the canary would be put inside it and there's an oxygen tank on top and then the valve would be open. And so the hope is that the canary, if it was passed out and the chamber would fill with oxygen that it would be revived and, and it wouldn't die if the miner could get it there on time. So, so through my <laughs> research, I was able to find actually one of these devices, which is something that I really wanted to include. So this is on loan from the Royal Alberta Museum. It's part of my exhibition um, and it's just displayed as an object. Um, and the symbol of the canary awaiting resuscitation is something that I draw and use throughout the exhibition as well. But it's quite a, it's quite a large object. And, um, I just found it, its presence uh, really effective uh, alongside the rest of the works. So um, this is part of the exhibition as well. It's a series called West Slope Cutthroat Trout, a canary in the coal mine. So the West Slope Cutthroat Trout are often referred to as a canary in the coal mine because they're warning about the dangers of the selenium contamination from coal mining. Um, and this is a participatory artwork, so often I'm really interested in finding ways to engage people directly in the work, um, sometimes in completing the work. So I started working with milk um, and kind of painting with it to do a number of works in the exhibition. And I really like the way that um, essentially it creates this invisible drawing. You can't really see it. It's also difficult to see while you're creating the artwork. So I like that kind of added layer of um, the potential loss of control over like what the final work will look like. And so I've done hundreds of these drawings, it's ongoing. Um, and, um, and I also have done a number of workshops where people are invited to reveal these invisible images of the fish um, by rubbing it with pieces of uh, charcoal that I've collected from the crow's nest pass. They're also invited to take the drawing with them. So it's a way for the artwork to move outside of the exhibition space. And also um, I'm really interested in these forms of exchange that move beyond the initial like viewer artist dynamic and actually like allowing um, people who come to the gallery to become collaborators in the work in some way and, and complete that work. So this is um, a video piece that plays in the exhibition alongside a series of artworks. So here you see a piece of paper and, um, and I've created a, uh, a series of milk drawings of plants that have been known to grow on grassy mountain. And this time I reveal the invisible drawing with the flame of a candle. So it creates this, um, it's kind of a slow reveal process and the sounds are sounds I recorded um, during my research. So it's crickets, it's bees buzzing. Um, I was really thinking about the insects too and sort of the small things that we don't necessarily think about in these landscapes. And that's why I wanted to kind of draw attention to. So there's various plants, most of them are, are native plants. Um, some are, have been naturalized and then there are a couple um, invasive plants as well. And so this was something as I was learning more about the, the types of plants that grow at these sites and was thinking about just how, you know, the, the landscape speaks to processes of uh, colonization, the legacy of colonization and, and the continuing impacts of colonization. So this is what the overall piece looks like. You can see the, the drawings that were revealed using the flame of the candle on the left or, or on the right, and then um, those that were revealed using charcoal on the left. And these are some workshops uh, that I've been doing alongside the exhibitions, um, kind of teaching this technique and opening up this process as a way for people to think about, you know, what is being lost in the landscape, what is disappearing that maybe we're not even aware of, whether it's um, uh, plants or wildlife um, or something else, or maybe a kind of viewpoint of a landscape altogether. So it's really interesting to see what people want to um, create and also the conversations that evolve around loss and climate change and kind of using art as a way to process 
um, the impacts of loss and grief and not in a way to like immobilize us or paralyze us with these emotions that I think can be really overwhelming, but in a way to kind of um, spur us to action and to say, okay, well, what, what can we do? And so I really do see art as, you know, part of that um, can be part of a process of, of having dialogues around these things that are really important, but sometimes um, difficult to talk about. This is another piece in the exhibition. It's a collaborative artwork with Latifa Peltier and Med. And we've been working together since 2016. Latifa co-owns ALCLA Native Plants. Um, and uh, so she is a botanist and also an herbalist and an artist. And I've learned so much from her um, about um, the importance of native plants. And so we've done a number of um, pieces through the City of Calgary Public Art Program, walking projects, and also workshops, um, many online with COVID, but more recently in person as well. And, um, and we're really interested in um, establishing and creating relationships through art and through education awareness between people and plants and really talking about the importance of of planting native plants um, and, and how that can be an act of care for the landscape and, and one that is um, speaking to, I think, relationships of, of reciprocity and restoration and remediation. Um, so the piece we created is called Seeds for Grassy Mountain. So these are all wild collected seeds not necessarily from Grassy Mountain because we can't access it, but from various um, sites in Alberta. Um, and uh, they are all made of plant seeds. And there's different seed packet designs that I created. And these seed packets are uh, available in the exhibition and people are invited to take one or maybe two and then plant the seeds uh, to create a connection to Grassy Mountain and these issues and also to build a relationship with these plants and, and to develop their own um, awareness of native plants and their importance. So this is the, um, the crow's nest watershed and it's featured on one of the seed packet designs. And this is a canary awaiting resuscitation and it's on another seed packet. So this uh, structure you see, this is a repurposed core box. So it was a core box that was discarded uh, abandoned at the Green Hill Mining Complex. So I took it and I, um, I fixed it up, I painted it and I, I created a shelf out of it. And the seed packets sit on the shelf and that's um, where people can uh, take them uh, as they leave or enter the exhibition. And also interestingly enough, this core box was labeled GM for Grassy Mountain. So it may have once contained cores from the mountain. So as um, was mentioned in my introduction, I come from a long line of water witches. So that's on my mother's side. So the women in my mother's family have been known to um, uh, be able to locate where to dig or drill for pure potable water without use of scientific, scientific technology. Um, so for some people might not be aware of uh, what water witching is, but it goes by several names. It sometimes it's called dowsing um, or doodle bugging. Um, and uh, it's a, the practice of um, taking a, a tool, usually it's a forked branch, like what you see here, but it could also be rods or a pendulum or other objects, and uh, walking the landscape, and then the tool will move and kind of indicate where, you know, whatever you're looking for is located, which is usually hidden underground. So I kind of came to this like through this um, connection through my family, um, which is kind of dismissed actually now in my family, but I, I found it really fascinating. Um, and I found that kind of idea that, you know, it is considered controversial. It's a pseudoscience. It has connections to the occult. Um, it is a form of divination. So it's, it's not explainable, you know, and I wanted to talk about um, relationships to land and water. And so dowsing became a way for me to, to do that and to, to think about how do I undo my own settler colonial thinking and ways of being in the world? How do I disrupt an extractivist mindset, which I know that I embody in so many ways um, in the way that I have lived my life. Um, and so a lot of my work is trying to think about rebalancing 
um, the ways that we engage with the landscape, not as some inert object that we're just here on, but as something that we're actually in a relationship with. So with Gaussian, you know, it kind of speaks to that relationship because it's, it is about receiving information from the land um, and from the water or wh whatever you're trying to seek out. So this is a character of the dowser, which is me, um, that I created. Uh, and this is part of another project called Orphan Law Adoption Agency, um, where she kind of was going to these sites of contamination and assessing the land and and um, getting responses from these sites about you know what they're going through. Um, and so really notions of like reciprocity or something I'm thinking a lot about. I also uh, develop water witching workshops. So this is an example of one of those and they happen in different places. So it's a way of me sharing this process with others where I kind of introduce people to the tools and um, techniques of dowsing or water witching and then they get to explore um, the environment around them. And, and dowsing also involves asking questions. So it's a way to think about like what questions are we asking when we're in a place and and why and how and what is important to us and and in attuning our, ourselves differently to the, the landscapes that we're in how does it shift our perception of them and how does it shift the way we think about them and interact with them so uh dowsing also is, <laughs> was interesting to me because it has this complicated history tied up with resource extraction. So it's not just about finding water, but it's also been used um, in association with mining uh, in Western Europe, which is where my ancestors are from. So, so dowsing, when I started looking into tools and techniques, I came across you know, all these images of people using dowsing rods to find mineral ores underground that were you know, using it um, to mine resources in Europe. So it's like, wow, this is, this is very fascinating. So, um, and I wanted to delve into that kind of complex history. And I came across uh, Martine de Bertrand, who is also known as the Baroness de Beausoleil. So she was um, uh, the first recorded female mineralogist. Um, and she was also a mining engineer and she lived and worked in France in the 17th century. So I've been thinking about Martine for a long time and she's kind of been this, um, I guess, complicated muse of mine that I've been um, somewhat in conversation with in past works. And I felt like she was really coming back to me as I was doing this research. She was um, at the forefront of my mind while I was doing this work. These are just some images that, um, impacted uh, the development of some works I'm about to show in a minute here. Um, illustrations about how to hold a divining rod. Uh, they're kind of beautiful. I really like them aesthetically. But I kept coming across these images of like disembodied hands holding, showing how to hold or properly use dowsing rods. And then all, you know, dowsing rods showing up in all these different poems. So one thing about Martine that was really fascinating to me was that um, she traveled throughout Europe and she discovered mineral ore deposits in the service of the king. So she is, you know, part of the beginnings of this capitalist system and, and, um, and working in the service uh, of these colonial systems which ultimately she's killed by. So she ends up being accused of being a witch and she's imprisoned and she dies in prison. Um, she's kind of lost to the historical record. I don't know how she died exactly, but her daughter was also imprisoned as well as her husband who she worked with. Um, but her life was really fascinating to me um, because she spoke a number of languages. She was really knowledgeable in botany um, as well as like law, pyrotechnics, I mean, she had all of these people working for her. She developed her own instruments and tools to seek out in a mineral ore deposits. So she was um, using divination, but it was in this very secretive way because she never, and I can't find any record and people haven't been able to find any records of what her tools looked like. Um, and so she, it was, she was very secretive, um, but she wrote about her work. And so this is um, an image of one of her um, they're kind of called reports, but they're, they're pieces of writing that she did about uh, the work she was doing 
to find mineral ore deposits. And so I this was like really fascinating to me. So actually the phrase to dig holes and pierce mountains comes directly from her writing. And so that reading that just struck me because there's like violence in it. Um, it's kind of just this like incredible phrase also. Um, but in her writing, she's really trying to promote her work um, because um, and ultimately what might have led to imprisonment, and in my opinion, probably did, she had done a bunch of work for the king and she didn't get paid for it. So she actually wrote this text in a way to kind of say like, I deserve to be paid for my work. And then they didn't want to pay her and she's thrown in prison and, um, and she dies. So, you know, she's participating in this colonial system that ultimately she's killed by. There are these accusations of witchcraft so I'm thinking about all of this when I'm visiting these sites, which feel very haunted and, and kind of witchy in many ways. And so, um, so I created a video piece where um, my hands become these witch hands. And I also created this series of sculptures. So these are my hands, which I cast and they're these kind of typical green witch hands, which have these pop culture references and also references to like the Wicked Witch of the West. Um, and these long fingernails and this series is called coal futures so here i'm also thinking about like markets and futures and um and the value of coal and other commodities so these dowsing rods are all branches that i collected from the uh crow's pass area and they're all in balance and the hands themselves are balanced on cores and also chunks of coal and then mixed in with the coal is also coke from the uh, tar sands. And then this is a still from one of the video works in the exhibition where you see this witch hand is called Heg's Taper and this is um, mullen which is on fire and so mullen was one of the um, noxious weeds that settlers introduced to the landscape, which has been really damaging, um, that I was looking at the history of. And so uh, mullen, I could give a whole other talk on mullen and its uses, but it was used as a fish poison. It, was, it has healing properties, so it's an herb as well, um, but it was uh, used um, as a torch in, in Europe. And so it has all these other names like Heg's Taper, Jupiter's rod, flannel leaf, um, tinder plant, candlewick plant, witch's cradle. Um, and so mullen has been used as a torch in mines. Um, it's also kind of been associated with witchcraft because it was this idea that um, you know, witches would do their work at night and maybe they were using mullen um, and working by, by the, the light of mullen. But you know, it could have also been used to potentially burn witches as well. So. So I, I guess throughout this exhibition, like I'm just looking at the complexity of each sort of idea or object and, and its history. And so there's like multiple meanings and layers to each artwork. And I don't think there's any one right way to read it. Of course, everyone's gonna bring their own interpretations to it anyways, but even for myself, you know, just looking at it, it's like I'm, I'm continuing to evolve my understanding of like what these plants are, what they mean how they've impacted the landscape and what their uses are. So this is um, an installation called Rotten Pot in the exhibition. And there's this cauldron, which is also from France, this copper cauldron that was actually used. Um, it's not from the 17th century, from the 18th century, but I wanted this, this cauldron to kind of contain all of these different um, uh, plants that have been brought through settler colonization. Uh, to the landscape of Alberta. So I'm thinking about like removing them, then, you know, how can the landscape be rebalanced by offering these uh, seeds through the seeds through Grassy Mountain for Grassy Mountain Peace. So there's tansy, there's wormwood, there's Canadian thistle and mullen, as well as sweet clover. And then in the background, you can see QR codes. And so um, in the uh, Lethbridge iteration, um, the QR codes were uh, put up as a way to engage people in kind of their research. So each QR code would bring you to, um, it could be uh, like a website and it's to be water protectors or it could be an article or a video, all that related to um, open pit coal mining or 
uh, resource extraction, the different um, research that I did to develop this work. There's also a component of smell with this, which I think is really kind of lost, uh, I guess, with you know, wearing masks, it's, it's harder to smell. Um, but scent was definitely something I was thinking a lot about in developing this work too. I'm just gonna play a short one minute clip. So this is uh, video work that I created that's part of the exhibition. Okay, so um, so there you could see me kind of, um, you know, embodying these witch hands and you never see the body, it's just these hands. And so I was thinking a lot about Martine and like how would she grapple with the impacts of um, resource extraction on this landscape. And she doesn't have her divine tools, but she's just kind of faced with, um, you know, trying to figure out, you know, like how to cope with this. And, and so that's kind of just a little trailer, but the video is about 10 minutes long and, and you see these hands like emerge from the landscape and then encounter various sites. And um, sometimes the, it's really sensual, sometimes it's more unsure or awkward. Sometimes the hands are very kind of animal-like or bird-like, creating these, um, you know, different insect-like movements. Um, so thinking about care, but also harm and also like pointing to some of the damage that has occurred and, and trying to just think through the complexity of like understanding these issues and, and, and also thinking about like how we connect to nature. Oh, and one, one point I just wanted to make is that um, this tree is the Burmese tree, which is this really iconic tree that is, um, I think, considered like the most photographed tree in so-called Canada. And so it's it's kind of what um, uh, greets you as you come into the Crow's Nest Pass from the Alberta side. And it is a limber pine tree uh, that is dead. It's been dead, I think, since the 70s. And, and you can kind of see in the background that it's like popped up with this um, pull on it. It is quite beautiful, but I just also find it, you know, fascinating that like, this dead tree has sort of become the symbol that greets you as you enter this area, which has been so devastated through um, these uh, processes of, of resource extraction, yet it's still, there's so much beauty and, uh, uh, and, and is still in need of protection. Um, so I think uh, this slide just shows a few of the um, different organizations that I really look to throughout my research and if you want to learn more. But as I said, you know, these issues are really ongoing and I think it's really important to um, be aware of them. Uh, so Nipsitipi Water Protectors, CEQAs, um, and then Alberta for Cold Free Rockies. And then just before I end quickly, I wanted to uh, just mention this other project that I'm currently working on which is called Remediation Room. And it really came out of, I think, thinking about like a lot of these concepts of remediation. And, um, and so this project is really about supporting the work of other artists. It's put it through a Canada Council research grant and the artists involved are Christina Battle, Tamara Leon Cardinal, Rita Nico, Mia Rushton, and Eric Moscatetis, and Miguel Rodriguez. And so I'm kind of the, uh, I guess, a curator slash project manager initiator with this work. Um, and this piece is really in response to the Canadian Energy Center, AKA the Energy War Room, which is a uh, $30 million 2019 initiative of the Alberta United Conservative Government to quote, 
combat lies and myths told about Alberta's energy industry. So COVID has impacted the funding, but um, the work of the, uh, the war room continues. And um, it's part of this multi-pronged strategy that also includes a public inquiry into anti-Alberta energy campaigns. Um, and so this, I'm really thinking about this as a counterpoint to the uh, energy war room. And I want to support the research and work of artists investigating concepts of remediation in more nuanced and thoughtful and critical ways. So it's really about um, knowledge sharing, um, connecting artists to the public, and a lot of the artists involved uh, are often engaging um, the public in participatory processes. I actually have a workshop tonight with Tamara, which I'm really excited about. Um, and so, you know, what role can artists play in really shifting perspectives of remediation towards restoring relationships and our ability to co-flourish with nature and each other? So there is a website, remediationroom.ca, that you can visit and I'll be, you can sign up for um, a mailing list. I'll be posting things on there soon. So thank you very much. Um, as I said, Processes of Remediation is at the Dunlop Art Gallery, the Sherwood branch until January 9th. And then if you're interested in learning more about my work, uh, you can visit my website and dowsinganddigging.com is a website that I created specifically for this project. So if you go on there, you'll find a lot more um, information about specific artworks and, um, and the overall exhibition. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alana. What, what a fascinating talk and so many layers. It's so, um, it's so rich. So thank you for unpacking your practice and uh, sharing that so generously with, with us. I have to say that I'm just um, wowed by, you know, the very sort of conscientious and careful construction of your projects, um, the beautiful tactility. Maybe, I don't know if that's intentional, but there really is a, a, a very beautiful um, sense that that tree is just gorgeous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that was something I, I was thinking a lot about. I want to, you know, how do you, how do you make connections? And it's not just through beauty, which yes, I am <laughs> using that very intentionally as well, but it's also through, um, through touch and, and through, you know, these different like tactile ways of engaging people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.